All right, so hi, everybody. Thank you for coming, um, both for all of you who are here in person and whoever is online here on our live stream. Uh, I am so happy and honored to have James Kerr here with us at Bloomingdale today. James and I, we went to, we studied together at Stony Brook with Maestro Jerry Witter, and we teach at the same college, at John Jay College um, of Criminal Justice, and I haven't seen him in years. <laughs> we never seem to coincide in the, in the campus. Um, but this program is brought to you thanks to the Bloomingdale School of Music Guitar Training Program, which is a program that combines music theory classes with ensemble playing and private instruction. Um, and the program we're featuring today, having uh, James Kerr, is just like a small window into all the varieties and diversities of roles that the guitar plays in the music world. We here at Bloomingdale, we teach a lot of classical guitar, jazz guitar, and we also explore the um, complicated and interesting rhythms of Latin America and the Caribbean on the guitar. And today we'll be exploring a very um, exciting program featuring music for blues and bluegrass on guitar, which I have no idea about, and I'm really looking forward to learn with all of you together. So please uh, join me to welcome James first to the stage. <laughs>
distance to me it seemed Church bells are ringing in this morning night Bitter tears I'm shedding all because of you Like a lonely prisoner serving his time is um, not so familiar to you all, um, the dobro, or the resophonic guitar. Um, so I'll be playing some of my tunes, some songs, um, some old blues tunes, and some bluegrass, and then talking a little bit about this, this instrument here. So um, the dobro, what we call the dobro, really started in the in the 1930s, um, early 1930s, um, two brothers, the Dopiera brothers um, from what is now Slovakia, um, were um, um, created this, this style of guitar 
uh, basically that has a, a resonator inside the instrument. So they created all the resonator instruments that we see um, in national um, guitars as well as, as the Dobros. So the Dobros had the wood body, um, but then this um, inside the guitar is um, basically an aluminum cone that looks basically like a speaker cone type of shape. Um, and it was this, this co unique combination of the cone plus the wood body of the guitar that, that creates this uh, unique sound that uh, drew me to the instrument and uh, those of us that uh, attempt to play it. Um, so it has a little bit more sustain than a, a standard guitar. And uh, back in the days of the um, prior to electric guitars and prior to guitar pickups, um, trying to create an instrument that would cut over a large uh, band or ensemble um, be a little louder, a little more sustained. Um, and then they come, came up with this. There's, there's two different styles of dobro typically. Um, this is what we call square neck, which is uh, played lap style, um, as I'm doing here. Um, and then they also made dobros in the round neck variety for more uh, bottleneck type, type style slide playing. Um, but the, the square necks really can only be played lap with a lap style. Um, and uh, even with the strap here, but still playing it. Um, lap style basically which comes from you know Hawaiian guitar playing um, the, the Hawaiian guitar craze 1920s 1930s uh, a lot of that got transplanted over um, and uh, and the dobro was kind of a result of that uh, but had a, had a unique sound um, so I kind of fell in love with the sound of it um, the way it's able to play you know a, a pretty melody um, with that kind of singing quality on the on the in the treble range, but also has that twangy, um, bluesy kind of a thing as well. Um, so yeah, Dobro just comes from the two the name Dopiera Brothers. Um, so when they started the company, it just became Dobro. So even though this is not a, specifically a Dobro, um, so Dobro is actually a brand um, brand name, but we we. We, we still tend to mostly call all instruments in this style dobros, um, even though it is now a trademarked, copyrighted, um, so we have to be a little careful. But technically, resophonic guitar is what these are also referred to these days. So the beard guitars who built this instrument wouldn't be able to even use the word dobro on their, their website or in their business, so it's, it's a resophonic guitar. But all the players, all of us, usually refer to them as dobros. Anyway, because uh, that was the original design, the original company. And back in the 30s, they were really mass-produced, um, quite cheaply, factory-made instruments. You could order one from the Montgomery Ward catalog, or um, so they were plywood um, design. But, but the basic design of the cone, um, the, the spider bridge, if you can see in here, it also has a very unique bridge that looks like a spider that sits on top of the cone. Um, so it really functions quite differently acoustically than a, a standard guitar. Um, so it's not the, the top that vibrates, you know, creating the, the tone. Um, it's really more like a speaker cabinet kind of a design, a wooden speaker cabinet with all that resonating inside. So the bridge, the spider design bridge sits right on the cone in there. Um, and then there's a, uh, a, ta um, a bridge. Um, Tail, tail piece right there, you know, in, over the spider. Um, so it really is quite a different uh, uh, design. But the guitars made today kind of take that basic design and just um, kind of souped it up a bit. This is a, a larger body instrument, so it's got a deeper body. Um, so a little more low end than the original guitars, it's louder than the original Dobros would have been. I've also got a, an old Dobro from the 30s um, at home, but my primary instruments would be contemporary builders who, who build these instruments. Also solid wood, you know, so they, you, you have small luthiers who build them in uh, nice hardwoods and stuff instead of the, the, the original plywood design. Um, and it's got an open sound well, so there's some, definitely some differences. Um, but the basic just has not changed too much since the original 1930s.
talk a little, a little bit more about all the gadgetry on this particular instrument, which uh, I'm sure you're noticing uh, as I go along here. But um, I'll play another one first here. I'm going to do an old blues tune. Um, I'm also um, spent a lot of time playing old uh, bottleneck blues, um, acoustic blues um, from the, the great 30s. Uh, slide players, and one of my favorites is um, a great player named Blind Willie Johnson. He's a gospel um, slide guitar um, player from the 30s, and I'm going to do one of his tunes here. This is nobody's fault but mine. <laughs> slide. Um, so very often he's vocalizing and then playing a melody line along with a, um, with a, with a bottleneck. Um, so I, I, I tried to adapt a lot of that to uh, Dobro as well. Uh, the tunes before that was a, um, a medley I didn't mention, but uh, this morning at nine in the Cattle in the, in the Cane. Uh, Cattle in the Cane is a traditional fiddle tune, and this morning at nine is a an old bluegrass tune, and I've, I've been doing that as a tribute to uh, Tony Rice, uh, one of the great uh, bluegrass guitar players um, who passed away the last year. Um, but he was one of the inspirations for me to get into bluegrass um, back um, back in my college days. 
So a couple tunes that he he uh, uh, recorded uh, that I do for Tony there. Um, but then here's one of mine. A little bit about this uh, wacky looking um, bridge you notice here, which um, get a lot of questions about. It's not a whammy bar. Looks like a whammy bar, but no. Uh, it's called this hip shot, uh, double shot bridge, and it basically allows me to have two totally different tunings on the same uh, instrument. Um, so it's it's kind of a a, a magical gadget where I just uh, pop this lever, and it's in a totally different tuning. So I can bring one guitar um, to the gig and and have a a D D tuning, which I'm doing now, and then uh, standard. Standard dobro tuning is a G tuning, open G, G, B, D, G, B, D, low to high. So that's what we hear on most all the bluegrass dobro and stuff. Um, but then I like to do a lot in, in this D tuning as well, particularly on old blues tunes. And, uh, and the hip shot allows me to um, just switch back and forth between the, the two tunings. It's got a roller nut, so it, um, you know, there's less friction. So the drastic changes. So it's not just like a capo where where I'm changing, which I do as well. Um, it's really a totally different tuning interbolically, the D the D tuning as opposed to the uh, G tuning. D to D A D F sharp A D. Um, so there's a lot of string tension changing and stuff, and so the fact that it can do it um, and be more or less in tune if it's set up right. It can it can go back and forth and be in tune. Um, has been uh, pretty amazing in terms of not opening up more possibilities for me to do stuff in the detuning, um, which otherwise would have required carrying two instruments or a lot of retuning on stage, which I used to try to do, but it's really not uh, not um, doable really to do the whole tuning down, you know, and then back and forth, and you're going to be out of tune and stuff. So. So the hip shot has been allowed me to do that and bring and bring one instrument. So that's what this gadget is here. And uh, so I'm going to do an instrumental of mine. This is called uh, Brandywine Station.
know, some of the um, <clears throat> key differences between the playing a bottleneck style uh, slide, which is when um, the guitar is upright in a standard guitar position, um, and it's typically for bottleneck, you know, you're wearing a, a slide, which originally was the actual bottle of a, the, the neck of a, a whiskey bottle or a wine bottle that was cut off and then smoothed out and, and worn on the finger. Um, it gives a very vocal-like um, singing quality to the, 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 the great blues players. Um, and it does free up these other fingers so you can still do things quarterly. Um, but the, the, the lap style, there is some things you can, can't, can't do with a bottleneck, which you, you've seen me do. These hammer-ons and pull-offs. Um, which in bluegrass kind of allows us to play more fiddle tune type eighth note um, lines and stuff and uh, keep up with the fiddle players a little bit more. Um, so these types of hammer-ons and pull-offs, um, which I'll talk more about, but that one of the key differences and then just I feel like when the bar is on top of the strings you just have a little bit of a greater deal of uh, a greater level of uh, precision uh, with the intonation and stuff going up the, the fingerboard. Um, so yeah, there's a variety of different tunings, but uh, the standard bluegrass tuning is G, as I mentioned. This this guitar has G and D, um, and then the bottom grid bottleneck. You know, blues players also would have used open tunings uh, very often. A G tuning, slightly different. So that instead of a G on the six string, they would have a low D, um, G D G uh, D G B D. Um, and also the detuning de exactly like this, uh, like Willie Johnson would have used, and um, some of the Robert Johnson stuff as well. Um, so I'm going to do, uh, let's see, this is another one of my tunes here. It's a song of mine I wrote um, long ago in this tuning. Um, reading a lot of history at that point and, and uh, writing these kind of long-winded historical uh, folk songs. Uh, so this is, I think, the one, the one that survived from that era of my writing, this one called The Sleeping Dragon. Thank you. 
first um, home in, in country music um, with a player named um, Oswald Kirby who played with uh, Roy Acuff who was a huge uh, country star um, on the Grand Ole Opry and uh, so Roy Acuff could be heard I mean uh, Oswald his dobro player could be heard um, playing one of these instruments um, on the Grand Ole Opry radio broadcast every Saturday, and that was probably the first um, example of playing this instrument that really um, drew people to the sound of the, the instrument, and then it was a little bit later in uh, the 1950s when it found a home in uh, bluegrass music, so uh, bluegrass really evolved in the 1940s, uh, the, the band Bill Monroe and his bluegrass boys. Um, with Earl Scruggs and Lester Flatt um, in his band in the 40s, really created the, the sound and the instrumentation uh, that became known as, as bluegrass. Um, and there was no dobro in the original um, instrumentation of, of Bill Monroe and his bluegrass boys. In fact, I'm not sure Bill Monroe ever really cared much for the dobro. But uh, Flatt and Scruggs, after a couple of years, um, took off and, and started their own uh, popular band, Flat and Scruggs, and they brought in a, a dobro player named Josh Graves um, in the early 50s, and he was really the, the first one to bring um, dobro to, to bluegrass music, and is really a towering figure for us uh, dobro players, Josh Graves. And uh, he learned a lot from Earl Scruggs, the, the great banjo pioneer. And uh, a lot of his, as you can see, we play with finger picks, uh, like a banjo player would, would do. Um, and a lot of the roll type, what the banjo players call rolls, uh, that kind of 
arpeggiation with the right hand. Um, Josh Graves adapted from uh, Earl Scruggs' banjo playing. Um, so he played with Latin Scruggs for a number of years and, and then influenced a, another generation to take up this instrument. And, and, uh, and it's kind of been in bluegrass ever since. So most of the, the dobro playing that people hear and have been exposed to has been as a, blue, as a bluegrass instrument. I enjoy trying other styles of music and um, pl playing jazz. I've got an eight-string dobro that I, that I do a lot of um, playing on as well. Trying different tunings, trying different, uh, uh, seeing what it can do outside of that zone. Um, but here's one of my uh, instrumentals that show you a little bit about the kind of connection to the banjo. You'll hear that banjo roll in there. So this is an instrumental of mine called uh, Sebastian Stomp. it up considerably. Um, any questions about this instrument or the, or the uh, techniques involved? Or we could get to that a little later. What do you think, Jose? Some yeah, I th I, we're going to have a Q&A at the end. Okay. But okay. I'll jump in and ask a question, actually, that I've been <laughs> okay. having since you explained the the device that changed the tuning. Is that from the original Dobro design, or is that something from... No, this is very um, recent. Oh, okay. So uh, only a few years ago that this came out. Uh, it's a, a company called Hipshot, and I think um, it's a New York-based company. It might be in Brooklyn. But um, they make bass gu electric bass guitar mm -hmm. bridges and things that where you can change one of the string tunings and things like that. Um, and then they designed this bridge for um, Dobro, I think just a few years ago. So it's quite a recent phenomenon. I used to have to bring two instruments mm -hmm. or, or, like I said, retune on stage, which was very time consuming and then you're gonna be out of tune, and, which I was anyway. But, uh, 
and, uh, and you get to decide like what are your your two tunings yeah tunings. exactly so okay. you could the standard ones are G and D major but you could do like a, a six tuning some people play or you could do a minor tuning you could really set it to anything you want so I do some play rounds with uh, several other tunings I, I play eight string dobro and that I enjoy doing some extra bass um, range on the low end so uh, when I'm doing jazz it allows me to do a little bit more possibilities um, accompanying people and um, you can never really be a chordal in, you know, jazz instrument on here um, so just so there's no um, fingering of, of frets and notes at all on this it's really all with the, the bar um, so there's no you know, chordal playing with your fingers or anything so that is one thing the bottleneck slide can do you, you still have a couple two or three fingers to um, you know put down some chord voicings you see Ryan Cooter or Derek Chucks or somebody on Dobro there's no um, fingerings whatsoever it's, it's all with the with the steel with the bar so in that sense it is quite limited um, harmonically and so forth what you can do um, compared to a guitar yeah. Yeah. So that segues nicely into the fact that, uh, yeah, this this is a Robert Johnson tune I'm going to do that I'm sure you'll recognize, but um, when Robert would have recorded this, he would have had those fingers free to um, grab some chords um, interspersed with his bottleneck play. The bottleneck was more for little fills and things, if you listen to Robert uh, Johnson, so he could really keep, keep the chordal playing going and keep his thumb going. Uh, like that left hand on the piano and so forth. So I've had fun trying to adapt some of his um, styles and some of that delta blues um, playing to to this um, lap style guitar and trying to grab those notes in other ways, uh, going to to great length sometimes to try to make it make it fit. But um, try one of his for you. Will it burn? 
at the crossroad pain I believe I'm sinking down Some Robert Johnson. Um, so I've talked a little bit about in some of my, with some of my students, how I think Robert, uh, too, and some people have theorized that his recordings were sped up or something to, to kind of explain uh, uh, the keys and his technique and his vocal range and so forth. But um, I, I strongly disagree. I don't think there was any speeding up. You know, there was four different recording sessions he did and the, the idea that they would have all been sped up the same way and um, so that, anyway that was a, a theory about 10 years ago but I think what he's in in that song is um, closer to A flat so the guitar is tuned you know there he's not in tune with our A equals 440 uh, which as we know is is, is not a, um, a, 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 a a consideration throughout uh, music history right so uh, he's in tune with himself, but his, his guitar, I think, is closer to A-flat, um, but it's in that G tuning, closer to A-flat, and then he capos the third fret. Um, so that's how I think he, uh, that's my theory, how he, how he played that. And then he can still reach with the bottleneck that B-flat B up here is kind of right where the joins the body, so it's, it's all playable and nothing unusual about singing tenor. Um, so that's my theory. And then he also did a, a lot of his tunes and the, uh, the D tuning as well, and also a lot of standard tuning without the slide. So pretty much three different tunings. Um, but some of those, uh, also Willie Brown, who he mentions in that song, has a, a famous song, called, or not so famous, but a great uh, blues tune, a future blues that has that exact same A flat um, tuning. So I think that was. What what Robert was doing, if you try to you know match it to the recording, go to the G tuning and but sh but sharp you know closer to A flat, um, and then capo. We got a picture of Robert with a capo, um, so that's how I think he did it. Um, so of course I've got way more songs than we have probably time for if we're going to do a Q and A, but uh, do a couple. Sure, a couple more maybe, and then we can open it up to some questions. Here's a, an old traditional, actually 19th century uh, song. Um, called the Sweet Sunny South. Where the 
Crops from the rivers green margins did grow And spread their sweet scent through the glade Take me back, let me see what is left that I know Could it be that the old house is gone And your friends from my childhood indeed must be must face death all alone. They say has grown through And the place is quite lonely around And I know that the faces and forms that I know Now lie beneath the cold walls of ground And then I'll return to the place of my birth Where the children have played round the door Switch back here into the, 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 the detuning. Uh, I mentioned a while back that I like to uh, adapt that technique of um, doubling the melody with the with the slide. Um, which really comes from the, the 30s acoustic blues players, um, a couple of which we've heard from Blind Willie Johnson. Sun House and Charlie Patton as well. Um, here's one of mine that, that's kind of in that style um, that we'll try for you. So capo, I'm sure people are familiar with the, this capo um, thing, which is standard device on guitars, but uh, it fun certainly functions a little differently on the dobro because um, it just clamps just the strings. It doesn't go around the back of the neck at all. But if there's some non-guitar players who aren't familiar, it just allows you to basically um, moves where the nut would be, so you can utilize the open strings um, and, and transpose songs to get the resonance of the open strings. So 
I think of it as not not totally cheating, but it uh, allows you to get that resonance, a simple that sympathetic string vibration um, that you wouldn't otherwise have, and it also allows you to do the hammer-ons and pull-offs uh, that I mentioned that we couldn't do otherwise.
thank you all so much. And here's one one last uh, short one in that same kind of style, but with the addition of the hammers and poles, so a little bit of the bluegrass influence in there on the dobro as well. And then if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to attempt to uh, illuminate some of the mystery around this <laughs> instrument. Here's one I call Alice the Cat. <laughs> This music and in one of James recitals you come out with the with the lute and you were singing the songs like mm -hmm. the Renaissance songs yeah. um, so that was for me like you know a really eye-opener like oh it's so nice to perform and, and, and sing the songs at the same time mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if there's any crossover for from what you're doing today with, with your preparation in the classical guitar and in, and in those like um, early instruments Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you apply into, into your playing today? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, it is a really a different different world, um, but I think you mentioned that the singing part of it is probably what carries over for me. Uh, I've always enjoyed vocalizing uh, for good or ill, and, uh, and something just I love to do, and uh, I love that repertoire, the, the Dowan songs, mm -hmm. and, the, and the Renaissance. Um, lute songs, um, being able, you know, the, the wonderfully composed parts for the the instrument, but also the, the great lyric writing and the great and the great songs that went with it. Um, so that that was really appealing for me, and I think that is something I like to do with my solo playing um, on this instrument as well, or in these other styles, is um, try to kind of find a, that balance between. Um, instrumental playing I'm primarily an instrumentalist but I, but I, I do love to sing so um, yeah finding that balance of um, repertoire that's instrumentally interesting but I, I do love to mix in uh, songs as well and I was you know just occurred to me that when 
usually in this early music world, we're, we're always talking about histor historically accurate performances where you try to yeah. use whatever historic resources are available to, to influence your performance. Do you see what you do with the older blues and grass on the dobro? Mm -hmm. Do you approach it like that? Like, are you looking uh, for historically <laughs> accurate? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, not so much. I think in terms of when I when I do um, study the Robert Johnson, I, I play the Robert Johnson song. I do take that approach with mm -hmm. his music. I try to really see what he was doing and capture as, as closely as I can to uh, his play. I feel as if those were really compositions. Mm -hmm. He wasn't really an improviser, at least in what he recorded, um, the multiple takes and stuff. He, he had a clear arrangement and uh, it was so well crafted and um, that I've never been someone to kind of take one of his songs and do like an indie rock version mm -hmm. of it or something, you know, what some people like to do. If I'm going to play that music, I like to really try to, 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 to get as close as I can to the, the sound right. that he created with the slide. and. Uh, and the same with Blind Willie Johnson. So I think as far as those early acoustic blues players, um, you know, some people go as far as to try to play the old Kalamazoo guitar that Robert played, you know. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that this is necessary. I do have an old um, 40s Gibson that my uh, uncle gave to me that I revived. So it has a little bit of that vibe of, you know, old kind of uh, double O size uh, Gibson guitar. Um, but Robert just played the instruments that were at hand were just uh, kind of cheap or whatever of it was mm -hmm. available. He was known to play some Kalamazoo guitars. Uh, but I don't I think that's probably the least important thing about his playing was his instrument, you know, the brand that he played and so forth. So so I, d I don't really go to any further than that with that. And then blue, there's some people who play bluegrass and are really only are into the old Oswald and Grade style mm -hmm. bluegrass. Um, I'm more, as far as the bluegrass dobro playing, I, I'm more into a contemporary sound of that, that music. I see. Um, God, that's the foundation, but I, I enjoy coming up with new instrumentals that I compose and very influenced by um, <coughs> Jerry Douglas, is the, the artist who got me interested in, in playing the dobro. I actually, amazingly, he didn't mention his name all the way through here, but uh, if you haven't heard, Jerry Douglas is kind of the towering figure of, of the dobro. And, uh, it was his playing that drew me to the sound of the Dobro originally. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he has always done both, played traditional bluegrass in some projects, and then with other projects, really tries to stretch the boundaries of the instrument and so I forth. And I, I tr enjoy trying to do that as well. Um, so, yeah, there's, I guess that's as far as the similarities go. Um, but uh, certainly when I was deep into the lute uh, repertoire, um, really the thing that uh, really caused me is just keeping those things in tune. Uh -huh. <laughs> if, that was, if that was an issue, I, would, yeah. I was very close to going, just going all in on um, early music and, and the lute at one point. I was really deep into that repertoire. And man, I, my hat's off to the people who can make that work and they can finesse the, the tuners yes. and the friction. And I mean, on a day like this, taking the lute mm -hmm. out and uh, these temperatures with the friction pegs and stuff, it would, I don't know how anybody would do it, keep them from slipping right. and all that. It's a constant struggle. And then as soon as they slip, you're going to be out of tune for the next 24 hours or something, yeah. you know? So um, I never, um, I like to spend my time when I have time these days of practicing and and not not as much with the, the care involved with, you know, making the frets. And, mm -hmm. uh, so. Yeah, I, was, I still enjoy playing that repertoire, but I, I did make a shift more into this type of um, dobro and, uh, and blues, and uh, less, at least in my performance, with the early music and the, and the lute. Um, yeah. All right. Any, any questions, students, audience? Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for coming out on this lovely day. Yeah, um, wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, sort of, uh, I assume, a more recent vintage slide, uh, which is the um, pedal steel. Mm -hmm. um, and I assume that's more of a pickup based instrument where you've got a volume control and things like that, but I've never actually played one, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I d have dabbled in the pedal steel. Um, 
And then that was another thing I, I, I tend to be overextended already with doing different things and that I decided was a whole nother lifetime and there's <laughs> certainly so many great players who just specialize in that instrument. So um, I decided not to go all in with that, uh, the pedal steel. But just quickly, the pedal steel, you know, um, there's a lot of possibilities because of the levers and pedals. So there's a couple different tunings. People use a, a six tuning and then a ninth tuning. So you get those swingy kind of uh, sixths in the chords. Um, but actually, in terms of the bar work, a lot of it is actually simpler than dobro because you can just hold the bar straight and then, you know, by manipulating the levers and the, and the, it, it does things like that. You know, which I would have to do, go to great length to get that in tune, right. and they could just hold the bar straight and hit a pedal, and it's a perfectly in tune, you know, one, four, double stop kind of a thing. But these kind of... Now we have to do with what we call slants, and that's where you, you actually slant the bar to get those sixths. Whereas there's, so it's, which is very hard to get in tune and uh, um, kind of like a violin up the neck just to get the intonation on the double stops with the, with the bar is, is, is tough. But that's a big part of the early kind of those kind of um, is the early kind of country roots of dobro playing and, and a lot of the great Hawaiian players who played um, lap style guitar were masters of you know all those slants and things in their playing right. but in terms of the bar work it can actually be easier with the pedal steel um, um, because like I say you can just hold it in a straight position and you can play a whole scale you know diatonically or you can do those double stops and things um, so there's some, certain things that are easier with the bar and then but it opens up all sorts of possibilities technically for what you can do um, that you could you could never do on this instrument. Um, so um, yeah, this this one I didn't get into. It does have a lot of gadgetry um, in terms of plugging in. So this is the instrument I use when I am going to plug in the dobro, uh, which I've struggled with for years because um, what drew me to this instrument is that acoustic tone that it gets with the cone and the, the sound of it. If, and if you don't have that sound, it's kind of like what's the what's the point of playing it. But the reality is, you know, if you're going to play in bands and um, and you're not playing in nice theaters and you know with long sound checks and stuff, we, we do have to plug in in certain uh, situations. And and for for many years, the, the dobro pickups were just atrocious. I mean, the the, the tone was was god awful, and I, I tried them all, and mm -hmm. and then they finally came out with one I can I can live with, the Fishman that designed with Jerry Douglas that. Uh, it was certainly a huge improvement for, from what was available. But this particular instrument has two, um, so that, that, that was the pedal steel that you were asked about, but there's also what we call lap steel, which is non-pedal, but it's an electric instrument. So that's lap steel, so you play lap style um, with some of the same tunings we do on dobro, but it's an electric instrument, you know, with, there's no acoustic, um, it's a solid body typically lap steel. Um, so I do that as well. And so this also has a pickup which really is more like a lap steel pickup. Um, so it's it's very involved setup on this guitar. Uh, but just quickly it's got two different pickups and then the jack is actually a stereo a TRS jack. So you I plug in a cable here and it has two separate signal chains. So I have one for the um, electric pickup which would go into like a guitar tube a tube guitar amp, and then the other set, side of the signal chain is the acoustic um, dobro pickup, which is supposed to capture some of the acoustic tone of the instrument, um, and that goes into a totally different signal chain with an acoustic DI and into the PA. Um, so um, this particular instrument has a lot of gadgets involved for um, when I need to plug in, but it does have this hip shot, which is why I brought it today, so I wouldn't have to carry two guitars um, on a series of trains and so hmm. forth so it uh, um, but ordinarily my, my preference is to play one of my other instruments that is just kind of the purity at least aesthetically of just the acoustic dobro um, but
But like I mentioned at the beginning, you can put all this gear on here and it's not going to impair the tone quality as if like a classical guitar where you need the top to vibrate freely and that's you know a huge part of the tone is the top. This functions quite differently. It's more like a speaker cabinet where you can put all this gear on the top and it's not gonna you can still get the acoustic tone, you know, with a blindfold test would be pretty pretty close to what it would be without all this stuff on the top. Um, so anyway, that's that's the pedal steel. It's a, really a whole nother whole nother instrument and a whole nother lifetime sort of. Uh, but there's some some players who are, have taken that to incredible lengths. And some of those Nashville players, uh, phenomenal. Yeah. Any, any anything so else? There's absolutely no bracing on the top of the guitar. It's just the um, cone. Yeah, it's really the cone. I mean, I don't want to say there's no bracing, but mm. it doesn't resonate freely right, that like way. a classical guitar in, in that manner. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah, it's more like a, a cabinet and the cone and the spider is mm -hmm. the, the tone in there. Um, I'm no expert in, in constructing these or repairing them, um, so mm -hmm. there's people who know far more than I do about setting them up. Setting them up and getting a good setup on these things is kind of an obscure art. There's only a few people that are really I do it at the top, top level, so um, I usually take it down to Beard Guitars in Maryland to if I need a setup. Periodically, the cones in there actually wear out. It's a very thin aluminum cone, and they start to collapse a little bit, and they definitely lose their, their tone mm -hmm. quality if you play a lot, you know, um, even within a year or two, so um, they need to be replaced. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of unusual. So if, uh, if something like that needs doing, I'll, I'll take it to Paul Beard in, in Maryland or, um, or there's a um, couple other guys that would involve shipping the guitar to them because it's not something that your local luthier right. is going to be. They can do basic things, but if you really want it set up tip-top, there's only a, a few people who uh, are really uh, are dedicated to uh, you know, doing, doing that full-time. Yeah. Have any, any other questions from... More audience. Well, thank you so much, James. Yes. Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you for the show. This guy, I have to say, is one of the finest classical guitar players I've, I've known in New York. So, um, so, so great to see you again today, and yes. I'm so blessed Bloomingdale has you here. Um, as an educator, so anyway, thank you all so much for coming on the on this cold Sunday, and uh, hope to see you again soon. You can check me out on website jameskerrmusic.com, uh, Facebook James Kerr Dobro, um, and uh, you can get some Dobro videos and find out when I'm playing and so forth. Um, checking out the website, um, so hope to see you again. Thanks so you, much. Thank thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody again for coming here. We have a lot of great activities happening soon, more guitar events. You can take the fire with you. Um, we are celebrating our 10th year as a doing the guitar festival on April 29th and 30th. So make sure to check that out. It's gonna be a great um, event. We're gonna have student sponsored, faculty, and guest artists as well. And with that, I'll let, I'll let you guys go. Have a good night. Thank you again for coming. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so glad you're doing it.